All right, everyone, we're going to come to the concluding work on this course, our introductory survey of uh, literature, part two. Uh, we're looking at Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And uh, with that novel, um, we are going to continue with some of the themes that we've seen in other works on the syllabus, um, namely the progressive dehumanization that is taking place um, under the auspices of efficiency, uh, mathematical and rational ordering of society uh, using the same sort of language, but now augmented by uh, technology. And uh, in many ways, uh, this novel can be seen as a companion novel to the one that we've just read uh, Orwell's 1984. They're often seen together. When I was uh, in high school, I read the, the two uh, in the same year and uh, saw some of the similarities between the two, which you doubtless had noticed yourselves uh, when you uh, read it. Um, 1984 is, dis the both of them are dystopian novels imagining not a better future but a far worse one but they're both futuristic speculative fiction uh and uh with that uh following in what becomes quite a dominant genre uh i would say um probably from the time and again you could see this going back to frankenstein with the theme of science fiction and the consequence of a rationally ordered managed society led by the intellectual elites leading not to human betterment but rather an impoverishment of sorts now as we saw last time uh it it uh, in 1984 uh it was unambiguous that this world was a bad world and one that we would not want to live in so the vision of the future was entirely uh negative and the image of a boot uh, stepping on a human face uh, forever in the future was a lasting image that is associated with 1984. This novel, on the other hand, and I've got my introduction here by Margaret Atwood. Um, she uh, mentions that uh, it's sort of it's unclear whether we would want we might actually not want to live in this world because there are things about it that seem rather. Um, pleasant. Um, and and uh, he uh, notes, uh, she notes rather that uh, that much of this is um, rather uh, appealing, that there's uh, regular uh, sex with whomever and whatever and however, um, that these things are not altogether unappealing. And I think that's part of the uh, nature of this particular dystopia is that it is not so terrifying and at the same time is entirely plausible. And uh, I think they need to be read alongside one another and the contemporary challenges of our day are to some extent seen in both novels. Uh, the growing of a totalitarian state, um, not necessarily an international state but uh, or global government, but, but in terms of uh, uh, a managed society augmented through technology and the use of technology and the themes of technology uh, in society have been covered in a wide variety of books. I just have a couple in front of me that I thought I would grab and draw to your attention if you wanted to look further at the topic as other authors have addressed it. Um, this one here by Jacques Ellul, The Technological Society, a uh, profound uh, analysis of how technology has come to shape and conform mankind so that we are no longer seen to be made in imago dei, but rather, uh, and no longer do we refer to being begotten, but rather we speak of people as being, uh, uh, term isn't manufactured, it's, uh, uh, well, the word begotten is no longer used, but we talk about being, uh, uh, gosh, forgotten the word now. That's an embarrassing lapse. Um, 
uh, it's begotten, not made. Uh, but now we talk about making uh, and manufacturing. The idea of creating uh, human life is, has been there since, uh, again, since for, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In our day, it is now a uh, present day reality uh, in terms of test tube babies, in terms of artificial insemination and so forth. Many of the things that um, Huxley envisages here as futuristic possibilities are now present realities. Uh, likewise, uh, some of the other features uh, of the society in terms of the relation of the sexes and, and the abolition of the family, these are also features of uh, contemporary society, which I'll talk about uh, further um, in the next episode. Uh, but I mentioned books related to technology, another one more philosophical, this one by Martin Heidegger, The Question Concerning Technology. Uh, and finally, uh, and this one I recommend, George Grant, the Canadian uh, philosopher, historian, technology and justice. All of them dealing with the phenomenon of technology, technology being, uh, it's a Greek word, but it's the product of something that we make. And uh, the idea that we are begotten, uh, but not made, um, has been abandoned very much so by uh, contemporary biotechnological techniques, which Huxley um, describes uh, right at the outset of Brave New World, so that we can no longer say that we are uh, um, unconditioned, that we are natural in our being. Uh, that this idea that there's a human nature is more and more giving way to the idea that we are conditioned. Uh, Huxley takes that idea and that theme and presses it to it, it, it to its extremity to the point where conditioning begins prior to birth even. And birth, of course, is no longer connected. Na the, the idea of um, uh, antenatal has the word natal, that is to birth. Well, they don't speak of birth. They don't speak of mother and father. These words have been abandoned or abolished and become repugnant in this brave new world in which they live and with it all sense of natural natural uh, claims on our identity as human beings these have been superseded by uh, the assembly line production of people in the name of efficiency that that term efficiency one that i've identified repeatedly on the course as growing in its um, importance and also its um, threat to humanity, we talked about it in relation once again to uh, uh, in uh, Swift's modest proposal, all the appeals to an efficient, uh, practical, uh, implementable way of dealing with the problem in that case of the expansion of the Irish Catholics, the poor Irish Catholics. He had a modest, modest proposal that could be uh, demonstrated numerically uh, that this would effectively solve the problem. Uh, we saw the same devotion to efficiency being cited in uh, Heart of Darkness and uh, in that the thing that Conrad cited uh, which distinguished us from the uh, empires of the past was our devotion to efficiency. We were no longer simply willing to take things uh, by force and rape, pillage, rob, steal uh, and then and then leave, we were now de dedicated, said uh, Conrad through his protagonist, to the total control and mastery of the earth. Uh, and so the dominion mandate given to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, multiply and fill and subdue the earth has been uh, transformed in modern uh, transhumanist technologies and applications to be not dominion under God, but rather domination under man. And so with this comes the theme of uh, humanism, but a humanism which is shorn of its Christian uh, heritage. Uh, humanism is not ipso facto a bad thing as long as the humanity which is being pursued is a right understanding of humanity. For Christians, the humanity which undergirds any proper understanding of the humanities is that of, uh, not of Adam, but rather of Jesus Christ, who remember in Christian theology is both God and man, fully God and fully human.
and it's in his character that we see the uh, template there for 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 proper human character to follow uh, in the way that he not only lived his life but related to both God and man. Well, those ideas are there implicitly or even explicitly in Huxley's novel, and uh, the there not only by um, the fact that they have been eradicated and explicitly eradicated, but also replaced in some of the terminology that's used in Brave New World. For example, um, let me think here. Um, the uh, figure of Henry Ford, uh, for the purposes of my audience here, maybe we don't know who Henry Ford was. Henry Ford was the inventor of uh, the mass production of the automobile. And he, in this brave new world, has replaced uh, Christ. Uh, there are solidarity hymns being sung to Ford. Uh, the crucifix, the sign, uh, or the cross, the sign of the, uh, the death of Jesus Christ on Good Friday, which we're coming up on just days from now, has been replaced by a T, uh, a reference to the Ford Model T, the assembly line uh, product production car, and AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, has been replaced by AF, after Ford. So not the year of our Lord, but after Ford. So a new dating system has uh, replaced that of the, that which was centered around Christianity. And the reason that Ford is is honored in this whole uh, world is because assembly line production uh, is the ideal here. Now, what is interesting is what precisely is being assembled and produced. And what is being assembled and produced, of course, is human beings themselves. That's the... Uh, uh, topic or that is the uh, beginning of the very novel is we find ourselves in a factory which is creating human beings and we there's precedent precedents for this uh, in other science fiction dystopian novels uh, one that I've done just now in my sci-fi and subcreation course um, HG Wells first men in the moon there it happened uh, on the moon by this what uh, uh, Wells called the Selenites, the, the uh, denizens of the moon, they were producing, manufacturing, uh, uh, and breeding a race of uh, moon dwellers who were specifically devoted and dedicated to the to the tasks that they would be doing in their lives. So they they all looked very different, and this was not accidental. It was not a God given talent. These things were were conditioned. Uh, so that the creatures that came about would fit their occupations and would be very pleased with them. There would be no satis dissatisfaction. So what Huxley has provided here is a sort of vision of the future, which is to some degree heavenly uh, and not hellish. I, I don't think there's any doubt that 1984 is a rather hellish portrait of the future. So hell has come to earth in uh, Huxley's Brave New World, there is a sense in which heaven has been brought to earth because every human need has being is being satisfied here rather than uh, repressed. We don't live with the uh, Junior Sex League of the 19 of 1984 where they're abstaining from sexual uh, uh, procreation and so forth. I shouldn't use the word procreation. I should <laughs> because that that doesn't happen, but sexual, um, uh, intercourse is not being avoided as it was in 1904. It is being indulged with no moral consequences and no other consequences whatsoever at all times. So it's very different in that sense. It sounds far more pleasing and uh, far more inviting, less dystopian, in other words. And yet, I think part of the genius of Huxley's Brave New World is that he suggests that this uh, this utopian world is not quite so beautiful after all. And I couldn't help but thinking uh, of uh, John Lennon's uh, famous song, Imagine. Uh, and I'll just read some of the lines here. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. So 
Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion to imagine all the people living in peace, living, living life in peace. That's what's being envisaged here. It is a heavenly world in which there is a sort of peace and where everybody is included and everyone is satisfied. There's no repression. There's no religion. There's no uh, idea of, uh, of hell or heaven reigning in this brave new world. And I think with this, uh, Huxley is engaging in whether he, uh, no, he explicitly intends on in, in theological matters. And uh, with that in mind, I wanted to say a little bit about the, um, the Huxley family and with their preoccupation with these sorts of, of themes. Um, so Aldous Huxley, uh, like his brother Julian, is the son of a famous uh, author uh, and, and, and human uh, humanitarian uh, writer. <clears throat> so his, his, his great grandfather was Thomas Arnold of the famous rugby school. His great uncle was Matthew Arnold and his, his aunt was Mrs. Humphrey Ward. These are all famous um, literary figures connected with education and so forth. Uh, his grandfather, on the other hand, is Thomas Henry Huxley, the man who was nicknamed uh, Darwin's bulldog, uh, who was a, uh, not only a proponent of evolution, but a, um, a critic of Christianity, a stark critic of Christianity. And his father is a writer, Leonard Huxley. Um, and his mother uh, was a graduate of Somerville College, uh, studied English literature, the first generation there. Very interesting. So this is a family uh, of uh, enormous intellectual pedigree, uh, both in relation to the arts and the sciences. Uh, Aldous Huxley, we know primarily as a novelist, that was partly because of his own uh, infirmities. He had certain health problems. Um, his brother, Julian, let me say something about Julian Huxley, uh, because I think he's an interesting figure, and he's an interesting figure to compare and contrast with, with Aldous Huxley. Um, Julian was, the uh, was a, a, again, like his grandfather, an evolutionary biologist and a eugenicist, and also an uh, internationalist. So he was a proponent of natural selection. Uh, um, he was the first director of UNESCO, by the way founding member of the World Wildlife Fund and the first president of the British Humanist Association and also the author of the Humanist Manifesto. And here humanism comes to be expressed and I, I would encourage you to have a look at the Humanist Manifesto that uh, Aldous Huxley's brother Julian pens. It's quite clear that it is meant uh, to be hostile to Christianity but understands itself as a sort of humanity as a religious um, uh, being and to be understood in strictly human terms where there is no heaven above us and no hell below. There is only um, the world and everyone living in peace and there's a sort of harmony. But note that there is an aspect of Huxley, Julian Huxley's biography that dovetails with his brother's portrait here and that is of eugenics. Eugenics is a practice in the 20th century uh, which transcends borders. Uh, we associated it uh, most starkly and negatively with Nazi Germany, where experiments were done on uh, peoples that the, the Germans uh, believed were, were subhuman. So experiments on Jews and Slavs, uh, on hom homosexuals, on uh, people with... Uh, uh, physical and mental disabilities. These were subject. These people were subjected without their consent, uh, or in some cases, knowledge, to experiments by the Nazis. Um, this uh, idea of doing experiments without the individual's consent was seen as uh, an atrocity, and it was uh, denounced. And there was a, a Nuremberg Code, which came and arose out of this, out of the Second World War, which made this effectively a war crime 
to do experiments on people without their knowledge or consent. Knowledge, uh, including the capacity to understand the moral consequences of it. So a child could not give consent because they have not yet developed sufficiently morally to understand the consequences of giving their consent. So con giving consent in entails or implies uh, the moral and rational capacity to uh, understand what consent means. It's not an, an insignificant point in, point in discussions of our day. Um, but uh, this idea of uh, the uh, Nuremberg Code, which is preventing this sort of experimentation, is being, uh, is being presented here in Huxley's novel in terms of uh, a, a reality as well. Remember, this, the, the publication date for this novel is 1932. Bra uh, 1984 was written after the Second World War. This one is written between the two world wars. And so in that sense, it seems prescient that it is identifying a world in which experiments on people were taking place without their knowledge and consent, because that's exactly what would happen, uh, was about to happen, or perhaps even was happening in his own day. And I said that it wasn't only the Germans that were doing this, eugenics was a practice widely endorsed in Britain, obviously Julian Huxley being one of the foremost proponents of it, uh, but also in Canada and the US uh, and ar around the world. Uh, people were being experimented upon by scientists uh, without the knowledge or consent of uh, the uh, individuals who were subject to the experiments in the name of furthering human progress in the name of being more efficient with the human resources of our world. And in this case, it's not ironically, but literally meant humans are seen as resources, products of nature, that the technique of the scientist uh, will utilize for his ends, for his experiments. And uh, it's a subject that is uh, of grave interest to the philosophers and theologians of the 20th century. So I just, I cited a few there and, and lifted a few books, Heidegger's The Question of Technology, uh, Jacques Ellul, The Christians, uh, The Technological Society, and likewise the Christian uh, philosopher George Grant, Technology and Justice, dealing with the problems of technology being used at the hands of the intellectual elites for the purposes allegedly of human betterment. Where are the ethical problems uh, where are the purported benefits? Where do we stand on this? Well, this is being presented here, not in a philosophical form or an ethics treatise, but in a futuristic fictional world. And I think highly effective for that. Uh, but it's interesting, and I said this at the outset, it's interesting that Huxley decides to include uh, explicit references uh, and and often replacements of Christianity in this brave new world. Um, this word, word, this phrase, brave new world, let me just say something about that as well before I, I get to that. Brave new world, the title is taken from a speech in uh, William Shakespeare's last play, The, the Tempest. Act five, uh, scene one, uh, Miranda, the daughter of Prospero, the magician that's been exiled on this uh, island in the middle of who knows where, it's a utopian novel, um, says this, Oh wonder how many goodly creatures are there here, how beauteous mankind is. Oh brave new world that such has such people in it. Um, Miranda's speech is ironic because Miranda, the young woman, does not recognize that the island's visitors are evil. So she is uh, blithe or optimistic about her in her assessment of the nature of the world. In the same way, I think we could see uh, Huxley's title of this novel is intended to be read and understood ironically. Uh, and those that fail to do so, perhaps Mar Margaret Atwood might be one of them. Um, although I think that's a little unfair, um, are missing the point here. The, the, the 
wonderful future being envisaged by a world in which there's no heaven or hell is one that Huxley most definitely uh, does not want us to embrace or see as wonderful, but rather as a horrific one. Uh, in other words, John Lennon has missed the point of this. Uh, but uh, back to the themes of uh, the the novel. Um, uh, uh, Huxley's uh, uh, novel, I think, can be seen. Um, and he says this himself, actually. Uh, and he says this in the uh, the Second World novel that he has in this book. I haven't asked you to read it, but Brave New World Revisited. He describes the theme of the first novel as the advancement of science as it affects human individuals. Um, and yet it has a warning uh, implicit in it. And it's interesting that it's there in this sense, given uh, his that his brother is the author of the Humanist Manifesto. The warning is uh, uh, about a world in, that has fled from God and lost all awareness of transcendence and in which the world is uh, committed to a soulless utilitarian existence in which the ideas of uh, human nature, any references to human nature, again, uh, the words mother and father are banished in uh, this world that he presents, anything that has a suggestion of a natural claim on our life, let alone a claim by God upon our life is banished from this. And all sense of purpose is removed from this world. We live life for today. Again, that's Lenin's world. Um, he says, imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can, no need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Um, that dream, as Lenin presents it, is a, it's a real anthem for many, this, this song, at least it was coming out of the 60s, was seen uh, 40 years earlier by Huxley as being uh, an absurd, uh, naive, uncritical, and clearly delusional uh, view of what was actually happening. Um, and the so-called sexual revolution, which John uh, Lennon was coming out of, was not a world uh, in which uh, we would find uh, ourselves in a better world, but rather in one in which uh, we were uh, given over to a soulless utilitarian existence, a dehumanizing one in which human nature has been commodified People's bodies have been made into things that are produced in a manufacturing line. Other people's bodies, we might have sex with them. We may take Soma, this uh, mysterious drug which uh, induces a sort of euphoria, but there, there is no uh, meaning or purpose to this life. So this pessimistic view uh, that Huxley presents, I think is very interesting given his brother's commitment to bringing exactly that world about. And I wonder what the exchange is between Aldous Huxley and his brother uh, Julian would have been like. Uh, but we can see here, and you can see it in the introduction even to Brave New World, um, he holds, does Huxley, that there is a transcendence uh, in the world. Uh, and he, so he's moved from his earlier cynicism, remember this is after the First World War, he's moved to a sort of a mysticism. He believes that there is a transcendent God. And uh, in the 1946 edition of Brave New World at any rate, he believes that attaining, and I quote here, attaining a un unitive knowledge of the imminent Tao or Logos, the transcendent Godhead or Brahman is the a uh, right aim of humanity. So he calls it a high utism. So it is still utilitarian, but it, he calls it a high utilitarianism. And I'll continue reading in which the greatest happiness principle would be secondary to the final end principle. The first question to be asked and answered in every contingency of life being, quote, how will this thought or action contribute to 
or interfere with the achievement by me and the greatest possible number of other individuals of man's final end. So this, uh, the answer is uh, to my question, how would Julian and Aldous uh, have discussed this? I think they, you can see them as working hand in glove because all that we have here is a humanitarianism or a humanism which has God included in humanism. And God and the idea of God as an abstraction, as a Tao or a Logos, uh, not the Logos of God, but rather the Logos of man. Not the Tao of God, the natural law, which we would speak of in, uh, in Catholic teaching, uh, social teaching, but rather the Tao, the imminent Tao, uh, and the imminent Logos, the imminent Tao, the moral law and the moral word of mankind being projected to include the idea of God. That's not what Christians are asserting when they are will, would might speak of the Tao as C.S. Lewis does in The Abolition of Man, by the way. If you're interested, that I, I refer you again to that wonderful book. Uh, let me see here if I can pull it over. Oops, that's not the one. This is the one, The Abolition of Man. Uh, he talks about the Tao being the moral law or the natural law or the law of human nature. Um, that is uh, what Lewis refers to as the Tao. I think uh, Huxley is not referring to that, that Tao, but rather an imminent Tao, uh, one in which the idea of God is included in human enterprises and activities. Well, in that sense, it, he would fit under humanism in which God fits in with our plans. All the same. I think you can see in this a uh, sharp crit critique of the sort of world that is presented uh, to us by uh, not only by Orwell in 1984, but by the general um, understanding of society as it develops here. Now, he does connect it, I guess one could say, with, hum with uh, capitalism. So the, the figure of Henry Ford is connected often with, with uh, with the um, growth and capital by the United States in the 20th century. So one of the reasons that Ford is uh, emblematic of the 20th century uh, America is because of the, uh, the uh, manufacturing um, production line of the Model T Fords and so forth, mass production. But uh, here the mass production is applied not to cars, but rather to people. And so I, personally don't think that this is a critique of capitalism so much as a, it is a critique of transhumanism. Transhumanism, which regards, again, people as things, as commodities, the commodification of human nature. Um, so this will to self-transcendence that um, Huxley portrays here um, is insufficient. Uh, to be a proper critique of what is going on in his day. I think in order to do that, we need the genuine Logos of God. Remember, the Logos uh, in Greek refers to uh, the word word, and Jesus is the Logos of God. He is God's revelation to us. He is the word who, by all things, uh, according to John's gospel, uh, he was in the beginning with God, and by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. That's the Logos of God. But here we have an imminent Logos <coughs> that is uh, seen not transcendentally. So here the transcendence is us re re reaching up, whereas in Christian theology, God comes down. He becomes incarnated as a man. He takes on human flesh. Huxley is trying to reverse the process. So I think I, with those comments in mind, I will conclude this introductory uh, discussion and I will then move on to an actual uh, critique of the, uh, the general plot line of the work and how it engages with what I've discussed here thus far. So I'll see you for the next one soon.